Alrighty, all right, welcome back, boys and girls, and everyone else who's joining us today. This is Meds Mnemonics, bringing on a whole new video. Um, before I get back into this, I just want to give a quick shout out to Share Bear. She's a good friend of mine, and I know she would appreciate this video. So without further ado, let's get this rolling. Oh wait, one second. If you actually like these videos, click the like button, and if you want me to make more, which I intend not to stop anytime soon, uh, try to subscribe, give me a litmus test if I should try to make more. But like I said, can't really stop me. I like doing this. It's really hard, and it gives me something to do in between when I'm trying to kill time between shifts. All right, let's get moving. You guys can read. All right, so quickly, this is going to be a medical disclaimer, meaning that if you have a serious problem, go see a professional or a medical professional. Don't just see any professional because I don't think a professional soccer player is really going to do you any good when you have a serious medical problem. So that's the whole point of that, and don't sue my ass. As you can guess, and if you've seen my other videos, I love to swear, and again, I'm not sorry. Okay, so I'm like super tickled about this topic. This is EKG examples. So a couple days ago, I actually made a video called EKG Basics. And it was essentially just an overview on how to actually look at an EKG and just the components of it. And this is actually going to be encompassing just examples of what to look for when you're actually scanning an EKG. And again, this is going to be a topic that makes students heartbroken. So yeah, so here are going to be the EKG examples. They're going to be here on the right. So we're going to go through SVT, AFib, A flutter, VTAC, VFib, right bundle branch block, left bundle branch block. Say that two times fast. Asystole, hyper and hypokalemia, which means higher low potassium, and then WPW syndrome. So without further ado, let's get going. So real quick, I just wanted you guys to see what actually like a normal sinus rhythm looks like. So right here, as you can see, you're going to have regular rhythm, meaning that if you look from R to R, use my cursor here, so from here to here, these are even, and they're symmetrical all the way through. The P wave is present, which is going to be right here, and the rate's going to be about 75, so like 1, 2, 3, 4. So if you do 300 divided by 4, it's going to be about 75 beats per minute. And then we're just going to look at the intervals real quick. So the PR, that looks less than one big box. Then the QRS is going to be less than three little boxes. And then the QT, which is going to be from here to here, is going to be less than two big boxes. So this is actually what a normal sinus rhythm actually looks like. OK, so first on deck, this is going to be SVT, also known as supraventricular ventricular tachycardia. So I'm just going to start clicking through this. It's going to have a regular rhythm, meaning that if you look at from R to R, from peak to peak, they're actually going to be even throughout. Sorry, it's kind of a shitty drawing, but didn't want to do any copyright issues, so I got out of a crayon and made this. So there, there are P waves, but you can't see them because they're actually buried because the rate is going so fast. And typically, you're going to have a rate over 150 beats per minute. If it's under 150, then it's going to be technically called sinus tachycardia. You're going to have a narrow QRS complex, so meaning that it's going to be smaller than usual. And then we're going to go through the treatment. So for stable, you're going to use SVT. So meaning like if they don't have alter mental status and they're not hypotensive, there's no weird shit going on. Meaning like the patient's awake talking to you and you see this on the EKG, you're like, okay, maybe we can treat it with a few things before we dive into serious uh, further treatments that we could use. So you're going to use SVT. So first is going to be sinus carotid massage, meaning that if you go up towards the neck, if you actually push on it, it could actually help bring down and stimulate the vagus nerve to actually calm down the rate. Number two is going to be Valsalva Maneuver. It's when you essentially try to bear down and just want to increase intrathoracic pressure and abdominal pressure. And therefore, it can elicit the same thing of stimulating the vagus nerve to help slow down the heart rate. And then temperature, where you have an ice bath immersion. So this can actually help them snap out of it and, again, lower the heart rate, which is the whole point of the treatment. And then if you want to go through like an actual drug, you can actually use what's called adenosine. So if you take the middle part of SVT and just flip it around, it actually looks like an A. That'll remind you to use adenosine. Okay, so let's say that they're unstable. So if someone's like alter mental status, or they look hypotensive, or they just look like shit, then they're going to be unstable. So if you see this in EKG, you're going to have to give them something else. So what you're going to have to do is give them the SV, which is going to be synced volts, which means to have a synchronized cardioversion. So you know when someone's having a heart attack and you're doing CPR, and then you shock them with an AED? Uh, that is called defibrillation. That is unsynced. You're just essentially just blasting them at any certain point throughout the rhythm of the EKG. This one has to be synced. So there's actually a mechanism on the like an AED or a defibrillator that'll actually start 
putting in like little ticks that can actually match up for the QRS complex. Because what you don't want to do is you want to blast them when they're actually having part of the T wave when the ventricles are repolarizing. So you actually kind of want to prevent that. So this is going to be a synchronized cardio version where it has to sync up and then you'll push a button when it's ready and then it'll hit it at the direct point to deliver a shock. And then hopefully that can take them out of SUT and they can go back to a slower, nicer, normal sinus rhythm. So that's SVT. Okay, so next on the list is going to be AFibs, which is also known as atrial fibrillation. So the quickest thing you want to do is you actually want to look at the R to R peaks, because if you get an EKG and you look at lead two, and you see that up here, these are actually, see how this one's short, this one over here is long, this one's long over here, this one's short, and it just kind of like alternates. It's not the same, it's not symmetric. This should be a big tip that you're dealing with AFib. All right, so let's go through the description. So first off, it's going to be an irregular rhythm, and that's very unique to AFib. It's one of the few that actually do this. So if you see this on EKG, you know, you know, what's that word? Um, bells. Yeah. Red flags, bells, uh, alarming things should be going. Uh, that's what I was trying to think of. Alarm bells should be going off in your head. Like, oh shit, like this should be, this is technically AFib. So it's going to be an irregular rhythm. AFib means asymmetric for the A. There are going to be no P waves present, meaning it's not in sinus rhythm. That's one of the first things you want to look for is if you can detect a P wave. And if you look at this, you can see my little scribble of, poor example, of trying to draw a fib. There are no P waves. It is a narrow QRS complex. And typically, the rate's going to be over 350 BPMs. So that's not always the case, but that's, you know, typically when you get like a test question or if an EKG is thrown at you on an exam, it will be roughly around 350. Okay, in the FIB, the second part of AFib is going to be for fucked P waves, meaning that you're not going to have it. And the way to remember that is just take the last part of FIB, which is going to be B, just flip it, and it looks like a P, it just means F B waves. Just think F P waves. So those are going to be fucked. Okay, so this is going to be how do you treat it? So if they're stable, meaning, like I said before, they're not alter mental status and hypotensive, they're not doing any funny shit. You're going to do a fib, which is going to be the rate. So you actually want to use drugs. So you're going to use calcium channel blockers, or you're going to use beta blockers. This is going to help control the rate and hopefully get it back into a normal sinus rhythm so it won't be so fast, and the R will start becoming symmetric in between the peaks. Uh, then you can use digoxin if the first two do not work. And keep in mind, for the calcium channel blockers and the beta blockers, you do not want to use this when someone's either having an MI or they're having congestive heart failure, because if you give these, they'll actually drop the blood pressure even worse and you make them more hypotensive. So that'll be a time in a test question where they'll try to trick you and like, oh, I got to do is just give them a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker and that'll fix the rate. That actually can like actually fuck up your blood pressure if they have congestive heart failure or they're having an MI. So just be careful that I just want you to be aware. Typically, it is going to be rate controlled with these first three drugs, but just be aware you can't always give these in specific search specific I can't talk today. Specific uh, situations. I was trying to say circumstances at the same time. Okay, so if they're unstable, you're going to give them a different treatment. So FIB is going to be flash. As you can guess, this is going to be a synchronized cardio version. But there is a caveat to this, is that if this is AFib that's been going on for more than 48 hours, what you want to do is you need to get an echocardiogram, which is essentially an ultrasound of the heart, or you want to anticoagulate them. Because the issue is with AFib, in the top part of the heart, because the, you know, the atria are not contracting equally all the time, there's like little bits and pieces of pauses. So, so what can happen is some blood can pool there and it can form a thrombus. And if you shock them with a cardioversion, you can actually knock that loose. That can cause someone to have a stroke. So you, that's a big no-no. So you don't want to do that. So that's the reason for the echo is to take a look at the heart to see if you can see a clot in there. So if you do shock them, it's not going to be thrown or kicked out and flicked. And it's going to run us all the way up to the brain and then cause a stroke. And the way that you can get around that is just anticoagulate them to make sure that there is no clot. So you can kind of bust that up before you do the actual cardioversion just for safety reasons. So that's AFib. Okay, so atrial flutter, it's a little bit like AFib, but a little bit more different. But it does have this unique, what's called sawtooth appearance. So let's just go through the description. So it's going to be a regular rhythm. You're going to notice that the peaks are going to be equal and symmetric. It's going to have a sawtooth pattern, saw pattern, I swear. I need to do hooked, hooked on phonics or something. I can't speak for shit. There are going to be no P waves. 
rate is going to be tachycardic, and it's going to have a narrow QRS complex. And roughly, it's going to be over 250 to 400 beats per minute. So the treatment's going to be very similar to AFib. And a mnemonic, just to kind of remember like what A-flutter actually looks like, just think, did I stutter? So the ST is for sawtooth. So this one's pretty basic. Just They essentially just want you to pick out that it's atrial flutter. That's most of the questions that I've got. And then if you're going to treat it, just treat it like AFib. So just go to, the, go to the past slide, and you'll be able to pick out exactly how to treat it. That's A-flutter. Okay, so now on to an interesting one. This one's actually going to have two slides because actually treating it involves three situations. And I couldn't fit exactly everything on the slide very well, so I made one slide advanced ahead of this to actually show exactly how to treat VTAC. So this is VTAC. Let's go through the description. I mean, tachycardic, meaning that's fast. It's going to have a wide, bizarre QRS complexes. So that's what these guys are. So these are going to be super wide here. It's more than three little boxes. Just remember from the past video that QRS is easy as one, two, three. So this is clearly bigger than three boxes. And this is actually what VTAC looks like. So obviously, it's going to be tachycardic, so it's going to be over 100 beats per minute. And this is actually life-threatening, because if this continues, this actually can further exacerbate into VFib, which can further exacerbate into cardiac arrest. So if you see this, you want to fix this fucking pronto. So here is, there are going to be three situations of when you treat this. So this is going to be the first one, which is they're stable, meaning that they're hemodynamically stable, meaning their blood pressure isn't fucking tanked or in the toilet, and they do have a pulse. So you want to treat them with drugs. So you can use amiodarone or something like lidocaine. These are, there are other examples you can use, but these are the two main ones you're going to want to think of when someone has VTAC on their EKG, you can use these drugs. Okay, so semi-stable treatment, meaning that one of these has changed. So they're hemodynamically unstable, meaning you were talking to them, and all of a sudden they started becoming mentally altered, they start kind of slurring, kind of gibberish, or they become hypotensive or start to look like a little unconscious. You're like, oh shit, okay, this person's clearly not stable anymore hemodynamically. But, you know, you put your, you check their radial pulse or you check their carotid, they still have one. So they're still semi-stable. They're not totally like fucked just yet. So this is the middle weird one. So what you're going to want to do is you want to do a synchronized cardioversion. So just like I said before, when you're going to do, um, you know, SVT or AFib, you're going to want to deliver a synchronized shock. Because you don't want to do a defibrillation is what you see like on TV shows and when you're doing CPR. Because if you do that to somebody and they're still present and they're cognizant and they have a pulse, they are going to be fucking pissed. Because if you, that's like literally getting electrocuted. It's going to fucking hurt. So at the same time, you might want to sedate them just before you even do the synchronized cardio version. But that's kind of up to the situation and how quickly you need to address this. So just remember that when you do a synchronized cardio version, it's not as serious as like a true unsynchronized defibrillation, which is like a big jolt of electricity. So just keep that in mind. This person is going to be hemodynamically unstable, and if there is a pulse, you're going to do a synchronized cardioversion. Okay, so now if they're actually unstable, like for both of them, meaning they don't have a pulse, and they're hemodynamically unstable, well, that calls for a CPR, and you have to get an AD, which is an automated external defibrillator, slap on the pads, let it read it, and if it reads VTAC and there's no pulse, it'll tell you to deliver a shock, which is going to be to defibrillate. So, like I said before, when you shock somebody, that shit's really going to fucking hurt. But if this person doesn't have a pulse, they're not going to be conscious, so you're going to have to shock their ass anyways. So this is where you can actually defibrillate and deliver an actual, true, full-blown shock. And also, obviously, do CPR and do all the extra steps of... ACLS and, you know, BLS and CPR. So this is VTAC. And then we're going to go to the next slide, and I'm going to show you this a little bit more clearly how to remember this. Okay, so for VTAC, I think, like, if you're going to attack something, I just think of the band ACDC. So we're going to use these letters to remember what to do. Okay, so if you're stable, meaning that you're hemodynamically stable, they're walkie-talkie, they're, they're talking to you and looking at you, and their pulse is present, present you're going to use drugs. So you're going to use amiodarone and lidocaine. That's the A. So if they're not hemodynamically stable and their pulse is still present, you're going to do a synchronized cardioversion. That's the C. And if they're screwed in both senses, meaning that they're hemodynamically not stable and they don't have a pulse, which is really going to suck for them, you're going to want to defibrillate, which is the shock. And then for... For the C, it's going to be CPR. So the D is for defibrillate, and C is for CPR. So this is how you remember what to do for VTAC is ACDC. Okay, now we're on to VFib. 
which is ventricular fibrillation. So this essentially just looks like a bunch of scribble. So they actually, thank God I was able to draw this one because it actually looks like shit. And this is actually what it looks like on an EKG. So here's a little bit of description of what VFib is. So it's an erratic rhythm with no identical waves. Clearly this looks like shit. It has a wide QRS complexes. It's a rapid rhythm. And they're not going to have a pulse because just the perfusion and just the ventricles trying, like, that's what your heart is. It's a pump. It's meant to pump out fluid. And if it's quivering like this, the ventricles are quivering. Therefore, it's not going to actually develop the pressure to actually push fluid forward, meaning the blood. So therefore, the pulse is going to be weak, weak or faint or not present. And this is going to lead to sudden, sudden death. Clearly, that would not be good. So the treatment, you're going to use the word vape for V-fib. So you want to, they're going to be able to get the volts, which means you're going to defibrillate them. That's the V. A is going to be amiodarone. And then the P is the middle part of CPR. And then E is going to be the epinephrine. And then just really quickly, just kind of remember what V-fib looks like. It's just a violent frequency or the waves are fucked, meaning that you're fucked. So that's a quick way to actually how to remember this. So this is VFib. Just remember vape, and then VFib is violent frequency. And this looks like a bunch of gibberish on EKG. All right, so next is going to be a right bundle branch block. Um, I'm just going to essentially describe how to identify this on the EKG. I'm not going to talk about how to actually treat it, because essentially you need to treat the underlying cause. It can be a multitude of things. And it's a laundry list, and I really didn't want to fit this on a slide and you know scare the shit out of you. If, uh, there's no way I would remember that. So... I just want you to be able to identify it. If someone hands you the EKG, they'd be like, you know, do they have a right or a left bundle branch block? And you can be able to pick it out through this. So I'm just going to put out the description here. So for the right bundle branch block, the criteria is going to be a widened QRS, meaning it's going to be bigger than three small boxes. And what you want to do is you're going to want to look at lead one here with my cursor, and then you're going to want to look at leads V1 through V3. So what you're looking for, let's start with this, is you're going to want to look what's called bunny ears. So if you can look at this, this actually looks like bunny ears here, R, and then there's going to be a second one. This should not be here. This is the second one that's actually just part of the mechanism of the right bundle branch block. So when you see this in, v, in leads V1 through V3, then you know that you're possibly dealing with a bundle branch block. The question is, is, is it going to be right or is it going to be left? But if it's in the beginning leads, which is V1 and V3, which are on the right side, you're going to see these bunny ears. You can see them here, 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 and here. And guess what? Right there. And then what you want to do is you actually want to look at lead one. It's going to have a broad slurred S wave, meaning right here. So this typically should come down and then come back up quickly and then flatline and then, you know, propagate to a T wave. It doesn't do that. So like this part kind of like takes its time. So that's a slurred S wave. So if you know these two things, this is how you can pick up that it's a right bundle branch block. So I'm going to let you see how you're going to remember this. So you want to use the word wrap its, and you, what you want to do is you want to add two S's at the end. So if you look at the last part of the word, you can look at the IT and then SS. So the R is going to be for rabbit ears. It's going to be in V1, so the I is 1, and then the T is for 3. So V1 to V3. So these are the rapid ears through V1 through V3. And then the SS is going to be for slurred S wave, which is going to be in lead one. All right, so I hope that makes sense. I know it's a little bit of a stretch, um, but this actually works pretty well. You can just write out rabbits and just remember the ITSS. That's going to remember to remind you that it's V1 to V3, and it's going to be SS, which is going to be a slurred S wave. So that's right bundle branch block. I hate saying that. Well, unfortunately, I got to say it again, but with the left. Okay, so this is going to be a left bundle branch block. So again, I'm just going to show you the description. So again, it's going to be a widened QRS complex. You're going to look at lead one, and then you're going to actually look at the left-sided leads, which are going to be V4 through V6. And then you're going to have the quote-unquote notched two R peaks. So it's not going to be like true bunny ears, so it's going to look a little bit, little bit different. But it's kind of like a little mini bunny ears here. So you can see it here, and you can see it here. And then what you're going to look for in lead one is that there's not going to have that slurred S notch. Everything's going to be upright. The T wave could be inverted, but this part right here is it's not going to dip like it did with a right bundle branch block. So here, I'll just show you how I remember this. So for left bundle branch block, you're going to use later Lou, meaning that the ER, which is for the ears, are going to be in the later leads, meaning that they're going to be for V4 through V6. And then Lou is going to be lead one up. 
So that's going to remind you that there's going to be no slurred S wave and everything is going to be upright. Like this will be up, that'll be up. And that'll remind you that this is more if a left bundle branch block. All right, so moving on. All right, so I'm just going to go through these really quickly. We're going to, this is asystole, hyperkalemia, hypokalemia. So asystole, this is essentially flatline. This is what you see on Gray's Anatomy and what have you. But the one thing that they tell you that they should not be doing is you do not shock this. So when you do CPR and you have like a defibrillator hooked up and you can see the AKG, if you see a flatline, you do not shock this. This is one of the non-shock rhythms. So if you look at the word asystole, just look at S-T-O-L, I just think shit out of luck. Meaning that if you're flatlined, um, this is actually going to have a very poor prognosis and or outcome. They are not going to have a pulse and you should be doing CPR. Try to resuscitate this person to do what's called ROSC, which is R-O-S-C, which is return of spontaneous circulation. So if you say asystole, then you're essentially shit out of luck. This is the flatline. Okay, so the next one is going to be Hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia means high potassium. You're going to have peaked T waves, which is this guy right here. It should be the size of this P wave here, but it's fucking huge. I mean, it's almost the size of like the QRS complex. It should not be that high. So these are going to be super peaked. So the way to get rid of the potassium, which obviously intuitive is what you want to do, is you're going to use ABCD. These are the four ways you can actually get rid of potassium or get it out of the body. So you can use albuterol, you can use bicarbonate, you're going to use calcium gluconate. You can do dialysis if it's super fucking high. And then you can use diabetes drugs, like which is insulin plus glucose. And it's going to help either hide the potassium side cells or it's going to help get it out of the blood system via like dialysis. And then next is going to be hypokalemia, meaning low potassium. So I just think like hypo, I just think low money, you're flat broke. So you're going to have flattened T waves. So this guy, which should actually look like this, is actually flattened. And then hypo means under, which you're going to have a U wave. So this is the EKG, so like this is the P wave, the QRS, this is a flattened T, and then this guy that's kind of out here, this is a U wave. If you see this on EKG, this should indicate that you're possibly dealing with low potassium or hypokalemia. So that are these three, asystole, hyperkalemia, hypokalemia. Okay, so real quickly, this is Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. So this one's actually the most common ventricular pre-excitation. This is typically in young patients. So if you have someone that's like, you know, 15, 16 years old, or even less than 20 years old, and they start showing you EKGs, um, you may want to start thinking about WPW. It's going to be tachycardic, and then the buzzword for this is going to be a delta wave. So essentially what happens is, because it's pre-excited, this should be flat, and then it shoot up, should shoot up and do a, QR, a QRS complex. But it's not doing that. What it's, do is it, what it's doing is, holy shit, I can't speak today. What it's doing is that you can see this P wave here, and then it should flatline, but it's not. What it's actually doing is it's actually starting to tell the ventricles to start depolarizing and it's starting to contract early. So you're having this quick shift up. So what it's going to do is it's going to shorten the PR interval here, and it's going to widen the QRS. This is clearly wider. So that's what I said here. So you're going to shorten the PR interval, and it's going to be a widened QRS complex. And this part is what a delta wave looks like. And then the treatment for it's going to be procainamide. And I want to iterate this. Do not give them beta blockers. This actually can make it worse. So they can trick you. If you do miss this, if you don't see this in EKG, that they actually have a delta wave and it's a young patient, don't give them beta blockers. Just be really careful with that. So yeah, delta. So the Greek symbol actually looks like this. And that's what it looks like here, is it makes like a wide little wedge, like a triangle. And that's why they call it a delta wave. So the mnemonic for this is if you just take the letter W and just add a line below it, well, that looks like a symbol delta, so you know that it's delta wave. P is what you want to give them, which is procainamide, and then another W is that it has a wide QRS, which is going to be here. So that's how you remember what WPW is. Just remember WPW, delta wave, procainamide, wide QRS, do not give them beta blockers. Just please don't do that. Okay, so this was actually my last video. I just want to go through this one more time because I thought it was pretty good in a way to actually scan, now that you have some examples under your belt from this video, what to actually look for. So this is going to be the R8 method, meaning that there's eight R's that we're going to go through of when you actually look at an EKG. So the first one's going to be rhythm. You're going to look at lead two. Out of all 12, you're going to pick lead two. And then you want to see, does it actually have a P wave? So you're going to look at this red box right here, okay?
So that's a P wave. So that would mean that it's in a sinus rhythm, meaning that the SA node is the pacemaker of the heart and it has control. So that's a good thing. So number two is the rate. You're going to want to do R to R. You want to count the amount of big boxes, which is the thick and more red lines. And you want to add that up and then divide 300 by that number. And that'll tell you if it's tachycardic or bradycardic. Next, is it are the R to R, are these evenly spaced? Just like with AFib. If your hand EKG and you see that the R to R peaks are not even, so if this one does this and it goes short, small, short, short, small, short, then you're more than likely dealing with AFib. So that, that is a big tip that you can see that really quickly. So this one's a good one. And why I put it high in the R's, what to look for first. Okay, so next you want to check our intervals. You want to check, is the pure interval smaller than one big package, which is one big box? QRS to make sure it's not wider than three small boxes. Remember, easy is one, two, three. And then look at the QT interval to make sure that it's not bigger than two big packages. QRS is going to be wider narrow. And then rise, you want to see if there's a possible heart attack brewing and if they're having tombstones. So you can see this black arrow over here that if, if there's any ST elevations, this could possibly lead to what's called a STEMI, which is ST elevation myocardial infarction, which is a fancy word of someone's having a heart attack. Next is resist, which can be a block, like in a left bundle branch block or a right bundle branch, branch block, like we already spoke about earlier in this video. And then random. So you want to look for the delta wave, which is for WPW, peak T waves, which is hyperkalemia. And then this one I actually left out of the vid video because I thought it was it didn't really fit with the criteria of what I was talking about today. So it's S1, Q3, T3. And this would possibly indicate that someone is having a pulmonary embolism. It's not always present. And if it is, it's not 100% that the person's actually having a PE. But it's highly suspicious that if you do see that. All right, so that actually was the random eight method. And I'm pretty sure that after seeing it in this video, in the past video, it should stick. And that's a great way to actually scan EKGs when one is handed to you. Okay, so what I ended up doing is I ended up making a table and I had to spread it over three slides because all that shit obviously just wouldn't fit on one. So I'm gonna give you guys a second if you wanna screenshot this so you can actually screenshot this for your own uses of studying or making ANCA cards or whatever you wanna do. So here's the first one. All right, here is the second page. So it's got VTAC, VFib, RBB, LBB. Okay, we're going to go to the next one. And then asystole, hyperkalemia, hypokalemia, and then WPW. And I'll guys give you guys a second so you guys can screenshot that. And that's it. Wow, holy shit. I actually think I got through that pretty quickly. Um, I was very excited to make this video. Uh, it was a little difficult to figure out like what to put in this and what not. Um, but I just want to give you like the basics of, you know, EKGs. Like if you have this under your belt, I think this is a really great, really good start. Cause there's other weird shit out there. Like, you know, Brigada syndrome and QT elongation syndrome. And there's just a bunch of weird shit. And I didn't want to include it in this to confuse you guys, because I just wanted you to have a basic understanding of the most common ones you're going to see and that you're expected to know, like minimally. So I started with this and I may make a video in the future when I get a little bit more comfortable with the more weird ass ones you do come in contact with, but they're not as common. But I at least wanted to get this one out there for you guys just so you have a good basic foundation. So that's it. That's the EKG example. So if you didn't watch the EKG basics, I would go through that. And I don't think you should have watched this one first, but you know, it's kind of too late for that. So yeah, if you like this video, just let me know if you want to drop in a comment of how for me to actually improve my videos or, you know, how to actually improve delivering the content, uh, by all means, if you want to say something shitty, by all means do that too. I like, uh, you know, constructive criticism. So yeah, I hope this actually helps with you guys and yeah, I hope this is actually very helpful. So if you like it, click the like button. If you want me to make more videos, like I always say, it's a litmus test. Um, just let me know and subscribe. It'd be nice to get up to 10 subscribers. So uh, yeah, I think I'm only like two right now, but I'm pretty tickled that I have any at all. All right, I'm gonna shut the fuck up so you guys can go study and awesome. So love you guys, keep studying hard and I'll see you in the next video, okay? All right, peace.